So, welcome to the Vasm Assembly podcast. This is episode three. And after the two last guests, who were Alan Sakai and Abdeep Tigandlori from Google, I today have Luke Wagner from Fastly. Luke, do you want to present yourself real quick? Oh, sure. Hello. Uh, yeah, my name's Luke Wagner. I'm at Fastly. I've been Fastly almost, I think, around four years. And before that, I was at Mozilla for 11 years. I worked a lot on the JavaScript engine, which then transformed to be the JavaScript plus WebAssembly engine. And then, uh, then I started getting excited about WebAssembly outside the browser. So now I'm at Fastly. Amazing. So, um, you are one of the VASM OGs. So the original gangsters. So I thought I'd just, uh, dig down a bit in the history books and see what I can find out about you. And, um, so one of the things I ended up finding was a real old blog post by now from 2015 that you wrote while we are still at Mozilla. So I'm quoting, I'm happy to report that we at Mozilla have started working with Chromium, Edge, and WebKit engineers on creating a new standard WebAssembly that defines a portable size and load time efficient format and execution model specifically designed to serve as a compilation target for the web. So can you tell us uh, how you remember the VASM launch, the collaboration with the other vendors? Um, how was that for you as one of the persons who re, uh, sorry, who co-wrote this history? Yeah, well, that, that was a very, very exciting and uh, pretty busy time. Um, we were you know, the, the big thing was we were able to start it with four browsers actively participating instead of developing and then kind of dumping it out in the open and saying, please adopt it. So that that approach helps things go a lot better because people are now getting to have their input included early in the process. But getting to that point of having four browsers saying, yeah, let's let's actively participate. And this took a lot of um, back channel conversations and uh, a lot of one on one chats with everyone to make everyone comfortable kind of taking this leap together. So it was you know, a ton of work up to that point. It's funny, it almost felt like the finish line, <laughs> but then of course it was just the start of a really, of the marathon. So you mentioned in your intro, um, you switched to uh, working on the server, but back then um, in the blog post, you wrote um, a compilation target for the web. So did you envision this thing to become greater and bigger and grow out of the browser into server and embedded devices and what have you? Well, we could look even then at what JavaScript was doing, and that is when Node.js was exploding. And so it was clear, you know, that if you define like a portable standard uh, language or compilation target that doesn't hard, hard uh, depend on being run in a browser, that you know people you know value standards and sandboxing, and, and will run it in all sorts of cases. So we knew it might be used outside, but we weren't sure if anyone would care. But, you know, that was, it was an intentional thing of like, yeah, maybe. In fact, actually, from the very beginning, there was like a non-web.md that I think still on the design repo that basically said, yeah, we, we, we want this to be able to be used outside uh, the web or outside of browsers. And you were not wrong, <laughs> especially now uh, since, uh, yeah, Basm at Fastly is uh, your day job. So yeah, that's definitely something that, um, like, I think most of the people who were initially seeing this might not have envisioned, especially also given the name. Um, but like, we're computer scientists, so we're really bad at uh, naming things. So JavaScript, yeah, it's Java, you know. <laughs> so most people were misled in the direction of believing, yeah, it's, you know, a script version of Java. Um, but yeah, so naming things is always hard. Um, but like, Assembly script is now taken, so you can't rename it to assembly script. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're stuck with uh, WebAssembly. Well, it is really, you know, it's it's sort of a fun definitional question of, you know, there's browsers, that's well defined, but is the web only that which runs in a browser? Or can the web be a somewhat more expansive term of this transitive closure of of uh, places to run code that are defined by open standards? You know, and, that, and that's, that's a more general definition. And based on that, you know, you could imagine that we're sort of expanding the reach of the web to to to, to include the browser and and also non, you know, starting to be non-browser places. So, you know, that's maybe over time it becomes a, a better name <laughs> as as these standards firm up and get used uh, in more places. Yeah, I mean this is definitely an option. One other option could be to just drop WebAssembly and just call it VASM because, you know, it has happened before that we just forget what the original thing was and just remember, oh that's it's Vasm now. Um, one of the examples that comes to mind is SOAP. So, what is it? Uh, so simple object, blah blah something something web services. So now it's just SOAP by definition. <laughs> but anyway, so back to the uh, Mozilla blog post that you wrote. Um, you further in this blog post wrote the following: 
as reflected in the high-level goals, a central requirement for WebAssembly is that it integrate well with the rest of the web platform and that the initial version run efficiently on current browsers using a client-side polyfill. As demonstrated, the polyfill can leverage ASM.js to get great performance. For existing mscripten slash ASM.js users, targeting WebAssembly will be as easy as flipping a flag. So that's a high promises there. And um, I look back at GitHub and you maintained the WASM polyfill prototype one. So was there maybe prototype two? I don't know. Um, so do you have a feeling for how it was used? So did people use this directly? It says prototype. So maybe you wanted other people to build their designs on top of your abstract definition of how a polyfill could look like. Like how, how did that go? Yeah, that, that was, I remember, yeah, the, the WASM po or the pro polyfill prototype one. <laughs> so that was mostly a proof of concept to say, you know, there was a discussion at the time of should WASM be a text format? And is if you gzip a text format, does it end up being as good as the binary format? So as kind of a, just a, just to get a data point, I invented a, an ad hoc binary format that I transcoded uh, ASM.js into that binary format. And then the binary format over the, went over the wire. And on the other side, then I was, I, I, my polyfill would, generate uh, asm.js text code into a blob very efficiently. I did that by actually writing C++ and then compiling that to, to asm.js. So I was running asm.js to decompile <laughs> of course <it> asm.js <laughs> and then loaded that, the blob as a script source, you know, URL. And uh, and first of all, showed it was fast enough that you could totally use this thing. It worked in like a few hundred milliseconds. And it was even after all the gzips and brotleys were included, it was much smaller than than the brotling or gzipping the original text. So it was, it was yes, and also the polyfill can be effective. But the binary format I made up was just totally ad hoc. It's it didn't you know it, it taught us a few things, but it also spooked some people. Big they were like, oh my gosh, Firefox is just about to ship this. And so I was like, you know, initially it was just called like I forget what it was called it like polyfill, and then I like added prototype and then one just to be like it's just a prototype and everyone else could do one too. I'm, so. Mm -hmm. Was, but there was never was a two, as far as I recall. Oh, okay. So there never was a two. Interesting. So one of the fun facts that uh, I discovered in uh, preparing the episode with uh, Alan Zakai was um, polyfilling VASM is now necessary again on iPhones, where uh, you have, if you have uh, locked down mode turned on, um, it disables JIT, it disables VASM. So um, there might be now a chance to come up with a VASM polyfill prototype two, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It could be done. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's interesting. It's just one of those fun facts that you discover when you research a topic that you just assume is no longer necessary. And then all of a sudden, like, like wait, updated 2014, uh, 2024, sorry, 2024, when you expected everything to have happened in 2014. It's like, wait, what's going on there? And then you look in the readme and it's like, oh, okay, interesting. But yeah, sometimes history just takes weird directions. Um, and talking of history, I want to go back to 2017. Um, so as we uh, just stated, you are a VASM OG. So your name appears on the PLDI paper from 2017. Um, we have a link to it in the show notes. And by the way, all the things we talk about, we link in the show notes. So definitely um, be sure to look those up. Um, and in this paper, you describe Mozilla's VASM implementation as follows. Um, Mozilla's Spider Monkey engine includes two WebAssembly compilation tiers. The first is a WASM uh, WebAssembly specific fast baseline JIT that emits machine code in a single pass that it combines, that is combined with uh, validation. And then further on, the JIT creates no internal IR, so in, uh, immediate representation during compilation, but does track register state and attempts to do simply simple greedy register allocation in the forward pass. The baseline JIT is designed only for fast startup while the long um, while the ion optimization JIT is compiling the module in parallel in the background. So I'm interested because this section of the paper has implementation details about all the other vendors as well. So here you sort of describe Mozilla's approach. Um, I'm curious, like back then, was there sharing of best practice? Like, uh, hey, how do you do approach this? Or how are you solving this particular challenge? And then, of course, each of the browsers uh, had their constraints that they needed to work uh, with or under. Um, so how did that go? Um, was there some speed competition as well? Like uh, maybe some secrecy where people were like, yeah, um, we have this super uh, amazing approach there, but we won't tell you how we did it. Um, but like... Maybe we do, or like, how did that go? Was it was it very competitive? Competitive, or is it friendly? Was it friendly competition? Yeah, well, it was. It was. I would say pretty friendly. Um, a lot of the people who were working on Was Wasm had previously been working on JS engines and gone through the whole JS benchmarking benchmarking sort of <laughs> wars, 
And so everyone's kind of exhausted of how that can go when, you know, when everyone starts trying to squeeze water out of the stone. And so everyone's like, you know, benchmark is important. Um, and in fact, today people are starting to, you know, let's, let's, let's have some, you know, more WASM and benchmarks. But back then we're like, let's not do that yet. Let's just get it all working, get everyone on the same page uh, before, you know, we have performance races. Um, that being so, we, we did talk about implementation strategies. Like one reason to bring it up is sometimes like the ability to do what we did with the baseline JIT that you described and also streaming compilation, which is what paired really well with it, which is to say we're compiling machine code as it's arriving, as the bytes of bytecode are arriving over the wire, we're emitting machine code before we've even seen the end. Hmm. The ability to do that required constraining WASM in some ways to not make certain assumptions that would break the ability to do that baseline streaming JIT. So you kind of want to share implementation technique to help explain to other people why you're saying we shouldn't do that. We should do this instead because you're, you know, you have to motivate. This is valuable, not just I'm opinionated. So, yeah, so we, we did share implementation techniques um, uh, initially. And, and, you know, we had probably, th yeah, for each browser, they each went about it in a, in a slightly different way initially, although I think there's been a fair amount of convergence now. There's, you know, multiple browsers have multiple tiers and, um, and, and yeah, there's, you know, we all learn and measure each other. So. And we, of course, lost uh, the Chakra engine. So that's uh, one implementation uh, detail lost to history, I guess. Um, but yeah, like, very, very interesting. Good to hear um, that the competition was friendly and um, people shared best practices and so on. Um, I want to jump back and forth a bit in history. So from 2017, going back to 2016. And um, in 2016, you wrote an enthusiastic article in which you celebrated a WebAssembly milestone. So you wrote the following. I'm excited to announce that WebAssembly has reached an important milestone. There are now multiple interoperable experimental browser implementations. So back at the time, it was, uh, I guess, four or three, four? Four, I think four ish. I, I forget. The four ish. Yeah. State of release of all four, but they were, yeah, well under. So four. how, how did, how did that feel? Like, was it, was it a proud moment for you and the team? Everyone felt achieved or was this more like, yeah, a symbolic thing because you know that it was happening. So it was mostly, choosing the moment where you announce it publicly. Um, and then my last question on this, did you see developer um, interest spike after this announcement? Like everyone would be like, yeah, it's actually something that we can use now. Or like, how did that go? Yeah, it was a very exciting moment. It was it was also very stressful because we were making like changes to the implementation like right up before it's shipping and like kind of <laughs> landing patches on, on branches, <laughs> you know, release branches, which you're not supposed to do. But the encouragement we were getting from our higher ups was like, if you have alignment and agreement, ship it as soon as possible. Don't let anything derail you because the sooner you ship it, the sooner this thing is, this flag is planted. And, you know, until then anyone can have, you know, all sorts of objections can, you know, or all sorts of things can happen. And for example, Spectre hadn't happened yet. If Spectre had happened, it might've thrown a whole monkey wrench into, <laughs> for example, our threading story. If you look at all the whole things with Coop co co-app, shared array buffer, mm -hmm. uh, out of process, uh, I frames, all that site isolation, all that stuff. If that had all been, had to be discussed of how does WASM get threading, that might have messed up everything. So it was in retrospect actually quite good <laughs> that we shipped as quick as we could. And so, but all that meant is we were, we were working on polishing and, and, and making tweaks to the spec until like the last moment. Um, so it was stressful, but exciting. And, uh, yeah, so that was, that was a good feeling. But then, uh, you know, the, to your other question, you know, did ever, was there an explosion of, uh, of interest? Definitely people were excited, you know, a lot, it, it showed up in blog posts a lot, but what was funny is like, you know, we build a really good story. If you're like a C++ developer who has a large C++ code base, which is amazing, right? That was, that was definitely also the problem to be solved. You know, plugins were going away and, you know, that was for some people, their C++ strategy, um, so, so we definitely solved the problem, but, but a lot of people are like, well, I, I don't write C++ or I want to write C++, but I want to reuse it. I don't want to mostly write C++. I want to have this library be in C++, but I don't want to reuse it from my mostly JS and HTML and hmm. CSS uh, web app. And so there were some aspects where like, oh, that, that story's not done yet. And and a lot of it was on producer tooling, which had to be built out yet. So there there was some almost counter reaction of people like kind of, you know, you, you release a thing, you're like, oh, it's, everything's wonderful. But then immediately you find out, you know, all the pain <laughs> points and how it's, you know, uh, it, it's not, you know, it's not doing everything that you hope it might yet. So who do you think was the most excited? Was it uh, game developers who could port the Unity games? Was it, uh, I don't know, uh, people with productivity software? Like uh, we've seen OpenOffice come to the web thanks to WebAssembly. Like what, what was the most interested use case that you solved with this? 
Well, Unity really made it the easiest for the most people because it was really just select the WebGL backends and then it just does all the work. <laughs> and, and it was a lot mm -hmm. of work because they, you know, they knew all the rough edges and they had cared about each one and they had a pretty good answer for each one. So, and from what I hear, it's, you know, this is years ago, I'm not a date, but, uh, but it was, it was a hugely popular backend. Um, it was like one of their most popular backends of all, like, you know, like probably like tens or twenties of, uh, or thirties of, of backends. And it was, it was one of the most popular. So, so that was, that was, I, th I would say, uh, kind of casual game developers kind of just got a new target for free. But even in the days of Asm.js, uh, we saw, um, people poured, um, all these Linux applications, um, over to the web, which was, I think, mostly, um, from the KDE world. Um, so productivity stuff. Um, did you ever envision back then something like Photoshop coming to the web? Well, it's funny you mentioned Photoshop because like for a while, like, almost the rallying vision statement was Photoshop on the web. <laughs> um, so yeah, like, yeah, that, that, that was definitely the goal, but it was, it was a hard thing to achieve. And I know that y'all, you know, team did a whole lot of work with Adobe to help, you know, burn down all the remaining blockers to make it possible. And so it's, it's very exciting that, uh, that, that is, it is now on the web and as well as a bunch of other Adobe products from out of here. And so, yeah, it's, that's, that is kind of, I guess, literally a dream come true. And talking of dreams, so maybe, um, since now the illusionary, we will never achieve this, but let's just set the objective of Photoshop has become reality. What do you think is the next, uh, illusionary thing that we will solve with WebAssembly? Just as a quick uh, sidetrack here. Yeah. I mean, I think there's two, you know, maybe two complementary things that I'd like to see. One is, um, using WebAssembly in a way that feels more like I'm just implementing a library and. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I, I can write some code in not JavaScript and then compile it to ASM and then easily import it as an ES module from JavaScript. And, and it was like a non-event. It wasn't like, oh, I did some rocket science. I'm really, <laughs> I'm doing advanced mode web development. I, it's like, no, yeah, I just, I just did that because it was upstream in my languages tool chain. And then, and then I just imported it and, and it kind of just worked. So that, that's, that's, and if you look back at some of those earliest blog posts, which maybe you're probably going to get to small modules use case was was one of our like also dreams so there's like the big apps like photoshop and then there's the mm -hmm. opposite end spectrum which is lots of little tiny modules of wasm interleaved with js so that's one um and then i guess the other one which also still has some browser i think technology left to support is l allowing people to do development in their language of choice and kind of have a developer experience comparable to that of javascript today in terms of the performance, but also the dev developer tooling and the in-browser debugging and all, all that stuff. And that's hard. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, but, but after a bunch of, uh, work, I, you know, that, that, that would be another. Yeah. I think, uh, the, the state of the art there is still dwarf. So using dwarf and then with, at least in Chrome, you have an extension where you can, uh, install and then you get, uh, in DevTools, uh, the debugging experience sort of source mapped back to the original, um, code that uh, you compile to the web. Um, but yeah, like once we are there for all languages, I guess that's the next step there. Um, I like what he, what he said about the libraries. Um, so we think about this, um, a lot on the Chrome team and spe spe specifically, sorry, specifically on the, um, on a web assembly team. Um, so small things like, uh, I don't know, scanning QR codes or I've seen people, uh, use web assembly to scan, um, ID cards. So, uh, deciphering credit cards, deciphering, uh, ID cards. So this kind of things that, um, tend to be hard computer vision tasks or hardish con computer vision tasks, um, that you want to do in real time, ideally, um, without the user having to wait. Um, and um, yeah, so I think this is definitely something where um, we will see some development. Um, we also uh, have been working with the SQLite folks to um, yeah allow us to deprecate Web SQL so that uh, people could just use SQLite compiled to Wasm mostly as a drop-in replacement. We didn't quite get to the drop-in replacement, but it's pretty close. So. Um, yeah, I'm also personally very excited about this, but what he said about um, importing some code from JavaScript as if it were written in JavaScript, just like a, a, a regular ESM module, that's also something that's uh, very exciting. And um, I guess this also, of course, expands to not just the browser, but also the server. They can uh, develop with WebAssembly technologies, but use it just purely on the server. Um, we will get to this uh, in a bit. Um, I wanted to first discuss another like very, very weird thing that I noticed. And um, again, we're talking about 2016 here. Um, you wrote about the WebAssembly browser preview. And um, 
The following was in the block. So during this browser preview period, WebAssembly will still be behind a flag and there will be at least one planned change to reset the binary version to one, where we hope it will stay forever. Then I look in the WASM core spec and in the WASM core spec, it says explicitly this, the current version of the WebAssembly binary format is one. So the current here does a lot of uh, things like uh, it implies that the version number might change, but my, maybe not because it's not an objective, at least according to your blog post. Um, so when, when you think, does it have to change? Um, what needs to happen? Do you think this is going to happen at one point or can we just stay on WebAssembly version one forever? Yeah, ideally, yes, we just stay at one forever. I think ELF also does the same thing. There's a version somewhere in like an early Delf header and it's still one and it has been for like 20 years. It's just mm -hmm. the sort of thing that if you don't have it and later you wish you had it, then you really <laughs> regret not adding it. And it, you know, it, it costs like, you know, a bite. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I do hope it stays there. But the idea, you know, and that's because we've designed a binary format that it's easy to add things without, and, and this is just part of the design process of WASM is how do you make it add only? You don't break existing content, you only add, which is just generally don't break the web. That general principle applies here. So that's why we keep extending WebAssembly, but we've never had to bump that version because there's never been a breaking change. So um, yeah, hopefully that continues forever. But maybe after 30 years, people are like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I found a totally better binary encoding. Maybe of the same AS abstract syntax, but just as a different binary representation, let's have a V2. And it'd have to be supported alongside V1, but maybe it's like magically better in terms of side or something. But you know, who knows? So when you say better, what what directions of better could we go? Like decode size and size of the wire would be the two big ones. Yeah, it's just, it's a little weird thing that I found um, reading blog posts versus reading specs. Um, interesting. Cool. Um, next question is um, on caching. Um, the story there is a bit uh, longer. So your colleague, Lynn Clark, and she was the one who actually uh, established a contact to you. So thank you, Lynn, if you're listening. Um, so she wrote together with you and uh, Till Schneiderweit, a blog post called the WebAssembly Post MVP Future. And it's one of uh, Lynn's super excellent cartoon skilled um, or ca cartoon um, blog posts. And um, it's a cartoon skill tree. And um, in this post, you, I'm not sure who of the three of you wrote this, but like you in the plural sense, um, you wrote, um, with WebAssembly, if you load the same code on two page loads, it will compile to the same machine code. Yeah, makes sense. It does need to change based on what data is flowing through it, like the JS chat compiler needs to. This means that we can store the compiled code in the HTTP cache, which is great. Um, and then when the page is loading and goes to the to fetch the WASM file, it will instead just pull out the pre-compiled machine code from the cache. This skips compiling completely for any page that if already visited that's in cache. So amazing, that's great. Um, the thing is, I recently wrote a blog post um, on WebAssembly performance patterns, and um, I realized it's not actually possible anymore to explicitly, so um, using IndexedDB, for example, cache the compiled module in IndexedDB, the service worker cache. Um, you can, of course, cache the WASM files per se, but not the compiled versions. And, um, if you want to dive into this, uh, if you're listening or watching this, um, there's a number of uh, issues and PRs that I've linked in the show notes. And um, yeah, I just wanted to know, um, is this coming back? Um, because at least in Chrome, I think it would be, so talking to some of the engineers, it would be relatively easy to um, just bring this feature back because we already store this and uh, I guess Firefox as well and uh, um, and Safari in the compiled version in the HTTP cache. But this is, of course, not something you, you do ex uh, explicitly. It's something that just implicitly happens. But um, if you, as a, let's say you're Adobe and your WASM uh, module is 50 megabytes uh, of, of size, because we haven't yet invented this magic binary format version two that would reduce uh, the over the wire size to the half, or to half of it, whatever. Um, like, do you think there's going to be a way to bring explicit um, caching of the compiled um, WebAssembly modules back. So this this was, caching was a whole fun story because initially there was no HTTP cache in the story. We, uh, the story was, uh, and I personally proposed this and also personally implemented this in Firefox and then later ripped it out myself, which was uh, <laughs> to allow WebAssembly.module to be structured clonable so you could store it into NextDB. And that felt like very explicit, like, yes, I am putting this here. And then the feedback we got from the W3C tag, the Technical Architecture Group, was 
No, don't use index B for caching. If you want to be kind of explicit about it, use the DOM cache, but also just lean into the HB cache, right? Because caches are complicated. There's a lot of heuristics. You want the browser to be able to do eviction based on its global knowledge of all the user's browsing history and stuff. Like there's a fixed amount of storage. This is not the right place to do your caching. Use the HP cache and the DOM cache API, which are now standard. And I, I, just to quickly stop you there, um, I think this predates the, the service worker cache APIs. Yeah, it... I think it, that was not mm -hmm. shipping it, but I guess it was in the process of being designed because I guess that was mm -hmm. like a, a five-year design process also that overlapped with yeah. assembly. But yeah, you're right. Initially, there was there was only the HP cache. Um, the, uh, the, uh, that's the one done implicitly by the network. And so initially, like we had shipped it in Firefox and then we had, you know, there was a little bit of a, tension over over this feature. And then eventually I started to learn more about caching and the future DOM cache plans. And I talked to some people who were more into caching. They're like, yeah, they're, they're right. So I in, in, in addition to leading the addition of it, I also led the deletion of it. I like filed the thing saying, okay, <laughs> let's just kill this. Let's do it the right way. And then I yeah, implemented it because you know the, the 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 integration with the HP cache. Fortunately, it was the same code to serialize and deserialize a module. And a lot of you know, and, and all, a lot of the work was the same, um, but it, and uh, but yeah, it, it was ultimately you know, it's it's nicer when it just happens, kind of automatically uh, with HP Cache, and and you 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 know, it uh, it uh, gives the browser more flexibility, and um, yeah, I think it's it's now you know implemented. It's, there's a whole fun scheme too where, you know, you don't want to cache the first tier code, you want to cache the second tier code, which is mm -hmm. compiled in the background. So you have this whole asynchronous mechanism where you're compiling the background. Then when it's done in the background, you have to have this link all the way back to the network cache so you can stuff it back in there. And uh, But you know, ultimately, we got it right, and it's you know, shipping in Firefox, mm -hmm. and it has been for a while. I think what would be really useful then would be um, to allow yeah, people who have really large um, WebAssembly files to store them explicitly um, in some sort of um, service worker cache, for example. Um, because yeah, this this can reduce um, your boot up time of the application by, I guess, a couple of, uh, I don't know, hundreds of milliseconds if you are really talking a large um, files. Um, I know that at least for V8, um, there's some, um, like for, for the HTTP cache, there's some heuristics that we use. So you want to become big, but not too big for um, the um, explicit compiled version caching to happen. So I think the magic number is 128K, if I'm not mistaken, or so 100, 120 something. Um, so I guess, yeah, each, each browser vendor has has their own heuristics there um, based on what, what's happening um, with the apps that they are seeing on, run on their browsers. Um, but yeah, so that's definitely something that I'm very interested in. And um, I would love to um, to see the issues become solved and uh, yeah, this becoming possible. Um, Anyways, yeah, so thanks for your insights uh, there. Um, I want to go back to um, the Bytecode Alliance one year update. So um, this was a very, very long blog post. And um, you can see already um, I did my research based on blog posts. Um, but I think this is very interesting just to dive into um, because the Bytecode Alliance one year update blog post was very, very long. Um, talked about a lot of things, but a bit hidden in there, it said the following. The Lucid and Vasm Time, Vasm T, Vasm Time teams, <laughs> double T, Vasm Time teams, join forces. Um, if you listen to this uh, and you don't know what Lucid and Vasm Time is, they're both um, Vasm engines, WebAssembly engines. Um, so continuing in the blog post, um, merging Lucid and, uh, am I pronouncing this right, by the way? Is it Lucid? So not French, Lucet or something like that. Okay, Lucid. <laughs> okay, so merging Lucid and Rise Time has been the plan since we announced the BA, the Bytecode Byte Byte Code Alliance. And it's about to get a lot easier to execute on that plan since the Rise Time team is moving too fastly. What does this, what does this mean for Bytecode's Alliance projects? Mozilla will continue to have a team working on WebAssembly and Firefox focused, Firefox focused ex exclusively, exclusively on the needs of web developers. As part of this, they will continue working on the crane lift code generator used by many projects, including Firefox, Lucid, and Wasm Time. Fastly will take on sponsorship, sponsorship for the work on the outset of the browser projects. So Fastly as a server company, cloud company that were hatched at Mozilla, including Wasm Time and Wasi. And we will talk about Wasi later. And um, we look forward to expanding the scope of that work further. So this was the official announcement. Um, I guess 
the number of uh, press PR releases this went through was um, incredible. But then Hacker News put this a little bit more bluntly. Hacker News just called it Fastly hires entire Wasm time, Wasm time team from Mozilla. So <laughs> as someone who um, was involved in um, this, I guess, takeover um, or acquire, acquire, um, acquisition, acquire session. So I'm trying to pronounce this right. So acquire and hire this, this mixed word. Um, so how was the switch for you? How did it, how did it feel for you as a long time Mozilla and working on all the um, WebAssembly uh, code from the beginning, and then all of a sudden, this uh, yeah, <laughs> company coming and hiring the entire team away, or like at least the last time team. Well, it, it was a little more nuanced than that. So this was during COVID, and mm -hmm. already there was a group that was in Mozilla Research, so not in the browser company, that was working on WASM and excited to take WASM outside the browser. And I was ha almost sort of half on that team and half on the browser uh, engine team, kind of working with both just trying to coordinate common standards. And so that team was asking for kind of, let's let's grow this effort. You know, WASM outside the browser is a lot of promise to integrate and do various cool things that are adjacent to the browser, but also spread, you know, open standard technology. And so they wanted to develop that and get more resources. But during COVID, Mozilla had two rounds of layoffs. And in one of those, I forget which round of layoffs, they laid off two of the best people on the WASM team. And so, it was sort of like, no, no more resources. And actually now you have two less people. And so the rest of the team just voluntarily resigned and said, let's go to a place that wants to support fully and is already sold on doing WebAssembly outside the browser. So there was no real acquisition or Mozilla Fastly level anything. It was just, you know, with everyone's, you know, blessing, a bunch of people, you know, quit and joined. And uh, and so it was, it was actually surprisingly, I mean, some parts of it were you know, it was a big change in perspective, but also, you know, it's kind of valuable just to get a whole new, just learn about a whole new, in, you know, part of the software ecosystem. And uh, so, so that, that, you know, was, was a big change, but in some sense, it was like working with the same people, working on the same code base, working on the same standards. So it's all, you know, other parts were surprising, surprisingly seamless. Yeah. So. Of course, I don't have any insights there. Um, I just read Hacker News and uh, Hacker News was very angry. <laughs> and, um, I mean, people have been bitter about, uh, Firefox uh, firing people and, um, Firefox uh, losing market share and then firing people doesn't go well together for, I guess, um, the regular Hacker News reader and commenter rather for the Hacker News commenter. So, um, there was a lot of angriness at, at this, but, um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, um, actually for you as the persons involved, um, it was mostly more like, um, your, would it be fair to say that your love for WebAssembly was greater than your love for the web and for the browsers? Is, is this a fair statement or would you just say? Back to that earliest thing I said, I, I sort of have a long-term, you know, dream that the concept of the web extends beyond mm -hmm. browsers, that we have, you know, a transitive closure of ex, you know, execution environments that run physically on your device, but also in various other places connected to your device and, you know, that's if you, you know, read into a lot of these uh, byte Alliance goals around uh, capability based security and sandboxing, a lot of that is are, are things that, you know, over the long term could build up to a fundamentally, you know, a lot of the, 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 the values of the web of, you know, focus on the user, user agency. A lot of these add up to, I think, in the long term, a, a story that can support that. So, you know, it's, I think, uh, there, I don't think there's a choice between the two. I think they, these, uh, in my mind, at least. Yeah, that's fair. Um, it's yeah, just very interesting to uh, come back to this uh, a couple of years later and hear everyone's uh, perspective again. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, layoffs happen, um, COVID happened, unfortunately. So I guess it was also just part of the economic reality that uh, the Mozilla um, direction back then was, uh, yeah, let's uh, focus our efforts. Um, but yeah, like, as I said before, I'm really happy that um, you, could just you know move on with your entire team and uh, continue the work that you were doing. Um, so one of the early blog posts that uh, then you wrote over on the Fastly side was about the Lucid engine. Um, it was eventually abandoned, and um, I checked the GitHub repo today is uh, is archived. Um, but initially, at least um, looking at the blog post, it sounded like there were plans to maintain both. So you wrote um, when Fastly open sourced Lucid, the first WebAssembly runtime designed for edge computing, they knew it would be useful beyond the edge. The other high performance WebAssembly runtime from the Bytecode Alliance is Wasm Time. 
still is. It shares many core comp components with Lucid and was developed at Mozilla during the period where Lucid was still a closed source prototype. So can you tell us more, like what, what happened there? What, what led to the decision to um, make Wasm Time be the winner and um, Lucid the archived project on GitHub that, you know, um, you took maybe some inspiration from, but in the end, Wasm Time was the one. Well, I, I, I guess you'd say that a lot of the optimizations and work that have been done in Lucid, Lucid got pulled into Wasm Time. So a lot of hmm. a large amount of merging and basically, there, you know, you need a bunch of pretty important optimizations to do a super high, uh, low latency, high multi-tenancy, highly scalable, um, you know, uh, edge computing platform. And so those learnings had been, you know, baked into optimizations in uh, Lucid that then got added to Asm Time for the benefit of lots of people. And so once all that merging work had been done, it was just a matter of what to call it. And so, you know, Asm Time's <laughs> a pretty cool name. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's definitely easier to pronounce for English speakers than Lucet because you don't know, is it French or how do you pronounce it? <laughs> All right. Yeah. So that's what I thought. Um, and I mean, it happens everywhere, right? So, um, just, uh, at the time of recording, uh, yesterday, um, Chrome, um, OS announced that, uh, the Chrome OS platform would from now on be built mostly upon the Android kernel. So for Google, it seems like, uh, and this is obviously way above my pay grade. It seems like, uh, people have little interest in maintaining two operating systems, Android and Chrome OS in parallel. So there's some merging there and synergies. Um, but yeah, I guess something similar where you steal the best parts of, of both projects and then just put them together to launch, um, or to just fo focus on one, um, is what happened there as well. Cool. Yeah. So, um, I promised to uh, focus on the WebAssembly system interface, WASI, um, which is something that you work on a lot. And, um, like WASI is come a longish way by now. So, um, we had preview one. Um, you just celebrated preview preview two. Um, there's a funny versioning thing. So I'm, uh, hogging on the version numbers uh, theme here. So WASI 0.2. Is also known as Vasi Preview 2. So is this a uh, semantic versioning? So are you aiming to have Vasi 1.0, but then preview whatever, um, 1.0.01 or something? Or like, where is this going? But before we dive into the version numbers too much, uh, maybe just let's, let's recap a bit. Like for, for people not familiar with Vasi much, who might have been using WebAssembly in the browser mostly. Um, can you just summarize for us um, what is the WebAssembly system interface? And I think um, it changed meaning. So VASI was um, meaning something else before it meant system interface. I think standard interface. Oh, well, yeah, well, that's that's even a separate little side topic. But yeah, the basic motivation is, you know, if, if you're targeting WebAssembly, you know, there's a whole spec to say, here's the set of instructions. But when at the end of the day, that code needs to call out and interact with the host. And in the browser, we just call JavaScript and the JavaScript ac has access to the full web APIs. And we were always very intentional not to give any WebAssembly any like kind of backdoors into the browser. Pretty much everything Web WASM can do, JavaScript can do like, and it's, that's because it's going through JavaScript for the most part. So if you are wanting to run WebAssembly outside of a JavaScript engine, then the question is like, well, okay, then what can I call? Because, you know, a WASM module in its structure can import and export any named string with any type at once. And in the browser, of course, it's you write the JavaScript that then supplies those named imports. So they don't have any special meaning. But then if you want to run WASM directly outside the browser, you're like, well, can we agree on some names and some types for some standard stuff? And so, you know, out of that kind of basic use case, kind of WASI preview one was like the most obvious direct answer was like, well, probably it should look a little like POSIX. <laughs> and so they, you know, Dan Goman, who's kind of led that effort, he, you know, started with Cloud ABI, which had already been developed. It was like also a, POSIX-like subset that had a lot of work done on security. And so WASI Preview 1 is, you know, is a derivation of what was in Cloud ABI. And so it's, you know, here's a bunch of stuff for files and reading them and writing them and kind of a way that can you can run it on Windows, but also on, on Mac and, and Linux and a bunch of other unices. And uh, so, so yeah, that's that's the basic use case. And, you know, it's initial, you know, initially and still actually Web WASI stands for WebAssembly System Interface. But as we started to evolve uh, or you know, just work on the problem space and see what are people actually doing with WAS WASM outside the browser. Like people don't want to just replicate containers and say, haha, we changed the ISA, but it's just a container. Like hmm. containers are great for what they are. If that's, you know, if you want containers, they already work and they've, you know, they've had like a decade of work put into them too. 
Um, fundamentally, people are using WASM to unlock new use cases, to put code in new places with a smaller that requires a smaller form factor or you know quicker start or smaller sandboxes or less resource utilization or better, tighter sandboxing than you can do with a container. So we need to look at where does WASM actually provide unique value and then say, okay, those are the use cases. What do they need? And do those want basically just POSIX? Because, you know, and, you know, if you do just POSIX, do people distribute like POSIX executables all around, you know, the web? No, they, they package them up in containers. So if you have a system interface that looks just like POSIX, you can kind of predict that path just ends with, oh, we'll just end up with containers because POSIX kind of is, isn't the best distributed unit of code. So you, you wrap it up into a container. So instead, we're like, well, what are people wanting to actually do? And, and sometimes you want file systems. Sometimes you don't at all. Sometimes you want to just be an HTTP proxy. Sometimes you want to be a database user defined function. Sometimes you want to be a stream transformer. You know, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of sometimes and they end up being different domains. So the first thing you realize is that there's not one homogeneous set system interface that's going to make everyone happy. If you focus, mm -hmm. force everyone to use the same monolithic, you know, interface, what they're going to do is they're going to hijack it and they're going to say, well, it says it's a file, but really I know it's actually, you know, a database driver. And so I'm going to be, I'm going to use ioctals or special rights to magic files to like communicate in like a coded language. And so from when I look at the interface, I can't tell it at all. It's only the dynamic behavior that ends up doing this. And this is, people do this a lot. People can make almost anything look like a file, but it's not always the most efficient thing to do because now you're taking what you wanted to say and like usually like serializing it down to something and then deserializing on the other side when you might have just been able to like say a thing directly and just like pass a pointer across a, buff a, a, a boundary. Um, and, and also when you have a piece of code you want to run, you kind of don't know what it really wants until you run it. So you can't look at it statically and say like, what do I, where does this run? You just have to start it up and be like, well, how does it fail? <laughs> like, hmm. oh, I guess it needs a Postgres database. I didn't know that from looking at it statically, but I see that it seems to be, you know, looking for a, po a Postgres string. That's just a big random example. So what started to emerge is this idea of saying, instead of one monolithic low-level interface, let's have lots of high-level interfaces that are kind of specific to like, what do I actually want to do? Do I want to talk to a database? Do I want to speak HTTP? Do I want to like, you know, access a key value store? Do I want to access a blob store? Do I, you know, do send messages? Um, and so we started to realize, okay, we, we, we have to change our approach here entirely. We can't just define one monolithic low-level thing that looks like POSIX. We have to have lots of interfaces. And one of them looks like POSIX, but a lot of them don't. And hmm. so based on all that sort of kind of development, which took a while to even realize what's the problem you want to solve, we we're like, ah, so we're not specifying a system interface that like implies there's one monolithic system. We're talking about a bunch of standardized interfaces that some hosts may or may not implement. But what we've done is said, if you want to do HTTP, you could do your own thing. But you probably want to share efforts with other people because you want to upstream this in standard libraries so you don't have to like maintain a bunch of custom SDKs. Let's agree on some standard interfaces for a bunch of standard stuff. And so that's the proposal is to, to re-acronym WASI to be to stand for WebAssembly standard interfaces. However, so much was changing all at once that it was like one too many changes. So we're like, let's <laughs> reconsider that in like a year or two. So that's the current state mm -hmm. of it is where it's, where it's a pending, uh, you know, thought, yeah, renaming. I see. So, um, when you introduced, um, Vasi, um, 0 0.2, um, there was, uh, the introduction of two distinct worlds. So can you tell us what is, what are worlds? So this is what you just described as the different, uh, interfaces that people have been in the past shoehorning on top of POSIX. Um, or like, what is a world in this case? The goal of a world is to capture the fact that the world, the, compute, the world of computing is heterogeneous. There's different places you want to run code and they don't all offer the same stuff. So if you want to say, how do I describe the stuff they offer? Well, an interface is just an atomic unit of, of functionality like HTTP or a blob store. So just an interface is too little. Uh, I need to describe a collection of interfaces that are provided by this thing. I give you HTTP and a blob store, or I give you, you know, whatever, a web, G a web GPU and, you know, the ability to talk to the mouse or whatever. So you need a collection of interfaces. And so a world's just that. It's a collection of interfaces. And the idea is that the interfaces, the name matters. Like when I say WASDP, that, sh that should matter. That should be the same string we say in a, a, a lot of places. Whereas the worlds are more like sets that we don't really care what the name was. We just care what's in the set. So in a world is the name of a world is more like just a shorthand for me just listing out all the things that are in it. So when I say, so getting to your question, when I say the WASDHP proxy world, that's referring to a collection of things that I can do. I can like log the standard outs. 
I can send outgoing re HTTP requests. I can receive incoming HTTP requests. You know, I can access, uh, you know, in configuration of very, in, in various ways. And, and that's what's in that world. But there's no file system in that world because when you're running a, on an actual HTTP proxy, there's usually not a file system or there is one, but you don't, you don't want to give it to the proxy code. <laughs> Uh, it's like an implementation detail. So, uh, and so that contrasts to the other world, which is the CLI command world, which describes what's, what's a, tr when I run a, just a command line interface tool, just in a traditional desktop operating system, what's usually available to me? Well, file systems and sockets and a bunch of other stuff. So, um, so these two worlds describe, you know, it's important when you launch a feature to, to kind of use it a little bit. So we're like, we have this feature worlds for describing heterogeneity. We have to start with at least two or else everyone's like, what's the point of worlds? So we start with just at least two, but the, the point is over as we evolve WASI over time, there's going to be a lot more worlds as we get more standards that describe more places to run code and more, pe more people and put WASM in more places to run code. So we expect to have WASI have lots more worlds in the future. So the development of VASI is happening in the VASI subgroup at uh, um, WebAssembly community group. And um, I think in this group, you're championing, championing the HTTP proxy um, world. Is that right? Yeah, there's a HTTP. Oh, would, would this be an interface? or? Yeah, and there, there's both. So there's the proposal, oh, okay. which is a collection of interfaces and worlds. Interfaces are discrete units of functionality, and the world's what pulls them all together. So within the whole HTTP proposal, there's an outgoing interface, an incoming interface. There's an interface that has all the different types, like requests and responses and bodies. Those are different interfaces, and there's one world called proxy. But over time, there may be like a, a caching proxy that is a proxy plus the addition of, of, of something that is a cache that you could implement with a Redis or a, or a memcached. This is mm -hmm. an example of the second world. So that, all that's in the proxy proposal, and I'm one of like four champions there. There's a bunch of other folks who've done a lot of work. I see. So um, if you compare this maybe to what we are seeing in the world of uh, JavaScript uh, runtimes like Dino, um, where essentially you go from what Node did, allowing everything to having explicit opt-ins where you can say, um, hey, I'm a Dino application and um, I want to get access to, let's say, the file system. Um, is this uh, implemented in a similar way in the VASI standard send where you can say, hey, uh, VASM time, run this. And by the way, I'm okay with this uh, code having a, having access to a file system. Yeah, well, it, that, that comes down to what's the user interface that a WASM time command, command line runner runs. Now, it's important to distinguish WASM time is a reusable code base that you can embed in a bunch of different things. Like the way Fastly uses it, we don't use the command line interface. We just take WASM time and embed it directly into a daemon of sorts that talks to the other parts of the system. And most other people do too. But there is this command line runner. And you know, from the command line, I can say WASM time and I can run a, com you know, a component or a module. And, and when I say that, I have various options to say, what do I want to give it? And so there's, that's, that's part of the user interface of WASM time. That's WASM time you know, as its role as a interface with developers says like, what does the developer expect by default? What's surprising? How can I reflect, make that not surprising? So if I say WASM time serve, I think I could be out of date here, but that one does not give you a file system by default, but does give you HTTP by default. So WASM time serve, because I'm you know, serving this thing, <laughs> you know, over the web or just, you know, using networking and HTTP. Whereas if I run it with, you know, just a normal, like as a command, well, it does get file system it, it, and there's this whole pre-opens mechanism of how I pass in handles to files that I want it to work on. So ultimately that's a, I guess, a developer or user interface question that each host gets to uh, decide for itself. So that's kind of similar to um, what in the web world we call user agent um, decision. So some user agents slash browsers might decide to whatever, um, grant you access to a certain feature for free. So without having to ask, um, uh, an example that comes to mind is uh, device orientation, which on iPhone and on Safari, you need to request permission for, whereas if you run it on Android Chrome, um, we just give it for you um, by auto enabling the permission, um, which by the way, I think is like, we might have to reconsider this, but this is my personal uh, opinion. Um, but anyway, so um, in this case, the user agent would be sort of the, the VASM runtime and each runtime can have um, its own decisions that it makes. And if you say VASM time serve um, gives you HTTP, I guess that makes uh, a lot of sense then. Um, but yeah, like <laughs> if you are a fast customer, you should probably not have access to the underlying um, file system that the thing runs on top of. Maybe not the real one, but a virtualized one that looks and acts like a file system, but actually it's backed by, let's say, a key value store. That's the thing that we can totally make work. So we can allow file system -y code to run, but the actual low-level capability might not actually be a file system, a real file system. It might be one of these virtualized ones. 
actually a great uh, transition to my next question, which is uh, on the Vasi polyfill. So I looked and for a while there was a, a Vasi polyfill that was maintained. And um, if you think things like files, right? So in the browser, you can not really create files, um, like at least easily. Um, there's a couple of manual steps involved. If you want to use the file system access API, for example, you can do this on at least some browsers today. Um, but like, I guess at some point, um, what we do in, in WebAssembly a lot is like um, work with in-memory file systems that look and feel like files, but are actually are not. Um, but like this is just one example of where Vasi becomes a different beast to handle in the browser than compared to when you run it um, on a command line or in a server or in the cloud in general. Um, like where are we with uh, the Vasi polyfill efforts or Vasi in the browser in general? Is this something that you're um, working on? Is this still an objective? There's yeah, that's big objective and a lot of work. And I, I, I'm not personally building, but I'm working with the people who are building it. So the 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 tool there is a Jaco transpile that takes a component, and we haven't talked about components yet, but you know, a package of one or more WASM modules that has high-level types to describe their interface with the outside world. You can feed a component to Jaco transpile, and it will generate for you core WASM code and JS glue code that run in browsers today. That ultimately that core WASM code is going to look like an ES module. So getting back to that dream that I mentioned at the beginning is mm -hmm. I think when you want lots of small modules, you want it to feel from JS point of view like an ES module, and JCO Transpile will literally produce you an ES module with imports and exports that have high-level signatures. So you're not seeing typed arrays and I32s, you're seeing strings and JavaScript arrays and JavaScript objects with objects on methods or with methods on, on prototypes. Um, so that's JCO Transpile. Now, if you have a component that imports a file system. Well, Jacob Transpire will say, okay, I'm going to import a file system from with a well-defined name. And it's your job to actually like supply an implementation of that interface. Now, if you think about it, that's just the same thing as mscripten does for its users with the mscripten VFS. Scripting gives mm -hmm. you, and that's actually v, the mscripten VFS. I'm not sure exactly if that's the, prop, the precise name for it, but that has been a huge inspiration because it's very flexible. It lets you mount different kinds of things at different kind of mount points in the virtual file system. And so I can say, you know, this I'd like, you know, and I think it has a bunch of options. There was an index B based file system. There's an in-memory one. There's one that uses like workers and multi-threading to do like synchronous stuff, I think in combination with index DB and workers. And it's like, you know, so there's, it has a lot of options. And so I think what that speaks to is when you have code that uses a file system, there's a lot of ways you might want to virtualize it. And so it's important to kind of decouple that and say, here's the interface boundary. I'm going to allow someone who knows how I want to implement this file system to bring that. And so that that's a thing we've spent a lot of time and effort in, in the context of WASI to make sure file systems are highly virtualizable. Which brings us then to, I guess, how do you describe these interfaces? Yeah. So 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 as part of, of WASI, we've we've defined an IDL. It's called uh, so an interface definition language for literally defining interfaces and worlds. Those are the two main things you define. Um, called WIT. And uh, you know, uh, and so when you, you write with it, you know, it looks not too surprising if you're familiar with IELs like you know Open API or gRPC or with protobufs. And um, but it's 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 tailored to uh, to to the types uh, that we need in WASI, which you know the types of the component models. So you can see you know say lists, and and variants and results and options and all these things. But also you can talk about handles to stuff that you don't want to copy. And so there's a you know it has the concept of a resource, which is a thing you don't copy. You have a handle to it, and the resources have lifetime. So if you implement them in a language with destructors and manual memory management, you have a destructor call, so you can free that memory. So anyways, there's a whole. It's a whole uh, aspect there, but uh, yeah, ultimately, WIT is our ideal for defining that all the, all the current in preview two, all the WASI interfaces are defined in WIT. And the really cool thing is, we use WIT to find WASI, but there's nothing WASI specific about WIT. Anyone can write their own interface in WIT, and it'll have the same first class treatment by bindings generators that WASI gets. So we kind of don't privilege WASI. If you have your own custom embedding of WASM or your own company that's embedding WASM. You get to write your own wits, and you'll get bindings generation in all the languages that have bounds that have bindings to wit, which is a you know a good number and growing. So it, it it's really helping, you know, WASI is important to agree on standard interfaces when you have them, but also if you want to do your own custom thing, it, it uh, you know wit helps you do that too. And um, so one of the things um, we discussed briefly when when we uh, synced up on what question should I ask you was um, this question of what did you learn from the browser regarding cross-language interop that informed WIT and eventually also, I guess, the, the component model? Yeah. So, so, so this, yeah, there's a bunch of hard-earned lessons from browsers because you think of browsers as doing a pretty hard job of cross-language interop between JavaScript and usually C++. I think 
and all the engines. It's it, Those are the two languages, right? So you have JavaScript that's running content, and then you're binding it to the C++ that's sending the browser. And so, you know, browsers started off, you know, just doing whatever works and kind of doing stuff incrementally. But one of the first lessons was it's really useful to have an IDL. And so in, in the web space, this is web IDL, which is which was not there at the beginning of the beginning of the web. People just made <laughs> random interfaces. So web IDL sort of like has to, had to have to reflect the web reality, which is this is how these APIs actually work and the precise details of how, how things get coursed to and from JavaScript and C++. And the, the big learning there was when we have an IDL, we can generate our bindings that face JavaScript and the bindings that face the C++. And what we can do is there's a bunch of hard, low-level tasks that are, first of all, very unsafe, very easy to get wrong. And when you get them wrong, this is where the security bugs happen. You have confused deputy attacks because you have this very powerful code, especially the host bindings that you know have, have full p- permissions for the whole process, right? This is this is natively trusted C++. Um, and it's getting, get, being given pointers and it has to be very careful to remember this pointer is trusted or no, no, I haven't, I haven't yet bounce checked this one, so don't trust it yet. And so... You have to uh, be very careful to not have a security exploit. So the, the the big learning there was let's have bindings generation, and and factor out all that really dangerous code. And and the way we get bindings generation is by having an IDL, which also makes the interface designer's life so much easier. If I'm defining like WebGL or WebGPU, I don't want to have to learn all about JavaScript details to be like, oh, how do prototypes work? How do constructors work? Like, what can I trust or not trust? I just want to write, <laughs> say, give me a string. I don't kind of don't don't even care where it came from. Or give me a sequence. Or give me an here's an interface and has these methods on it, you know. And so it it lets the interface designer focus on their domain of interest as opposed to JSisms. So one lane, one learning was have an IDL, and the second one was cycles uh, and lifetime matter greatly. And if you ignore them, you're going to have leaks, really bad leaks. And if you look back at like Firefox during the free v2 era, had a bunch of kind of leaks that gave it a bad reputation as being like you know a memory hog. But what was happening? was there was not any sort of, you know, th- you know, basically there was reference counting. JavaScript objects held a reference count on C++ stuff, C++ reference counted, and I hope we don't have cycles because when you have cycles and reference counting, you leak. <laughs> but of course, yeah. there were bugs, lots of bugs, and the web platform was growing a lot. And so there were cycles and there were permaleaks. And so in Firefox, I believe three, maybe 3.5, the big feature that a bunch of Mozilla engineers worked really hard on was adding a cycle collector. And the cycle collector traverse starts with C++, looks at reachability, goes into the JS heap, collects the reachability there to find cycles, and then it starts dropping references that are not rooted. And that's like that helped fix the leak. And it was a lot of work and it's and, and they're pretty happy with where the cycle collector is now. And I know Chrome had a similar long journey, long hard journey with lots of twists and turns that ended with, I believe, oil pan, in which had a different ultimately technical solution where we let the JavaScript where you know Chrome lets the JavaScript engine kind of be the owner kind of the GC, and then various C++ objects kind of are like owned in a sense by the JS GC. And that again allows the the, the, the V8 GC to, you know, find cycles and, and free them. And the point is, if you, this is a really hard world and you have to understand, you have to have access to the source code of both sides. They have to intimately collaborate. When you have bugs, you have just the worst things to debug because now you have to like think cross language. You have to have access to all the source code. So if we're trying to design WASM, an environment where we want to have not just two languages, but N, working together, <laughs> and we don't have access to the source code because we already compiled them to WASM. Don't have cycles by design <laughs> because it's going to be, we, we know how to lend. <laughs> it's going to start by, oh, we'll just reference count. No, that ends with, that ends with leaks and everyone's going to be, it's going to be uh, painful all the way. Instead, have explicit acyclic ownership. And so instead of just having a ubiquitous rec- reference counted sort of semantics in the component model, we have ownership. So we have handles that own a thing. And when you drop that thing, it gets destroyed. And 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 uh, and part of how types work prevents cycles, so that I can own your things, but you can't own my things. So we can't have a cycle that way. And then we have a uh, borrowed handles, which is if I call a method, I don't want to give you ownership. I just want to let you use it for a while. But by the end of the call, I have it back. And so you know these are pretty tried and true, tested kind of ownership semantics. And there'll be more over time, but basically they avoid cycles, kind of basically by design. And so that was another lesson from the hard-earned blood, sweat, and tears of like twenty years of, of browser engineering. So looking at um, maybe slightly related fields, so for example, the field of describing web services. So what does a web service do? What is the input and output of a web service? Um, we've seen languages like uh, Whistle. We've seen languages like uh, WADL Battle. Um, on the other end, um, like if you look at TypeScript, for example, which is concerned with yeah, describing what your JavaScript functions expect and so on. Um, 
like what is what is common and what is different from from those challenges that uh, both worlds have compared to something that um, wit needs needs to deal deal with. Yeah, it's a great question because it, it's sort of a midpoint between those two points on a spectrum. So TypeScript assumes one language, and therefore it's all it has to worry about is how do I describe this types, you know, the semantics of this one language JavaScript. So TypeScript entirely specialized to JavaScript. You look at the other side, other end of the spectrum, WSDL or now Open APIs. You know the hot current thing as far as, far as I understand. Also protobufs, those two. They're trying intentionally to be language agnostic. So their IDL is trying to say like what's fairly universal and mappable into lots of languages. And so you could say, okay, Wit's definitely a little more in the camp of the latter one. We're trying to talk about what's common, and we can reflect a lot of languages. The one interesting thing that makes it a little more like TypeScript is with uh, microservice sort of description languages, Open API. You're running like far apart across a network, and so it's it's really just data copying back and forth. If you want to pass a handle to a thing, you know, people do URLs, and then the lifetimes get you know, there's maybe and then webhooks are a thing, and then there's it gets complicated. <laughs> And it's all URLs, and there's no real like lifetime story. It's kind of like I don't know, figure it out yourself, and maybe just keep things alive, and then they TTL, give them a TTL, and then they expire, and you know, so it, that's not really solved. Where in the component model, we have multiple WASM modules. They're running in the same process. They're in different languages. So we need to be language agnostic, but they are in the same process, and so we can have do something a little stronger, which is to say, no, no, I'm just I'm holding a pointer into that one's heap. I don't know what language it is, so I have to be pretty agnostic to what it is, but I have a handle to it and I have these functions I can call. And so, and, and that's, you know, you, you can map that into a lot of different languages from C to all the way to like most scripting languages. And so we, we, we're a little more like TypeScript in, in that dimensions that we can have kind of direct pointers that aren't copied and have clear kind of lifetime. Yeah, very, very excited about this. Um, I need to dig a lot more into the world of wit and Vasi in general. Um, it's not something that I have uh, a lot of experience with. Um, as you can probably see from the questions that I'm asking you, but um, I guess yeah, coming from um, a web perspective, Bazi right now I think is still something that is in development for web, but um, we might see it. So talking about uh, a little bit more of uh, what might be coming to maybe Bazi Preview three or maybe four or something like what what things can people look forward to there? The the big one in Preview three is adding kind of native or built-in async support to the component model, and then WASI gets that. Because right now, if you want to do anything async, you know, I want to do an HTTP request, and while that one's running, I want to do another one. You know, in JavaScript, easy enough. I do a fetch, it's async, I get a promise, let's do more stuff. You know, to describe that in WIT right now, you have to like really make a lot of low-level stuff. You're like, okay, you call a thing, you get a handle to a thing that you can see if it's ready, and if it's not, you get a pullable. And then you get a bunch of pullables, and you do something that's like a select. And that's that's pretty complicated, and you're like, but I just want to write JavaScript. I want to use, <laughs> I just want to write Python and write async. I, or maybe I just want to do some blocking C code and like figure it out for me. Um, and so we can, you know, by pushing native async into the component model, we can say, yeah, we can have a built-in answer where in the wit, the in, in the types of wit, we can say this is a stream. We can say stream explicitly, and because I say stream explicitly, the binding generator is like, oh, I that's a that's a wit stream. I can turn that into a JavaScript stream. I can give you a readable stream. And now I can use all the JS nice things for readable streams without having to reinvent them myself or having to manually take whatever wit gave me and myself wrap that into a stream, which is what people are having to do now. So we're blessing, letting the binding generator do more work. And this is, this is the hard, this is concurrency, right? So this is like hard mode programming and it's, it's important and it's necessary, but we don't, we want to say everyone shouldn't have to do reinvent that themselves. Let's factor this out. So it's, it's good, good async with one extra important design goal, which is let's not introduce you know, if you've heard of the what color is your function blog post, which kind of complains about languages that have a distinction between sync and async functions, namely because they can't, can't call each other and it kind of partitions the world. You're either all async or you're all sync. Yeah. And so that makes sense at a language level. But once you're kind of at the WASM level and you have kind of separation between two different languages and they're shared nothing, they're not sharing low level state, we can do pretty smart stuff which is kind of what the OS does under the hood anyways, when you have multiple processes working together, which is like, oh, you're blocked. Okay, I'll switch to this other process that can make progress. And you don't have function coloring like in the operating system. Of course, it does it with threads. So the trick is, can we kind of do what the OS does to avoid function coloring, except not pull out the heavy hammer of threads and do it instead with stack switching, where we do something lighter weight, uh, where we just say, okay, you're blocked. I'm going to suspend your stack and switch that stack. So we're all on one thread, but we're just switching stacks. So that's also baked in design is how we have uh, components. One function here is, is synchronous. 
or, 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 or only lightly async. And this other one's fully async. It's using like its async language feature and they can compose and kind of the right thing happens in various hard cases. I gave a talk Very about exciting. this at Wasm IO uh, this, this year. And so if, if this is an interesting topic to anyone watching, uh, it's called a stream of consciousness on the future of async in the component model. We will link this for sure. Cool. Wow. <laughs> We've covered a lot of things today. Um, and I guess we could keep talking forever. At least you could keep talking forever about Vazi and uh, I could keep asking you questions about it. Um, but uh, like we, we need to stop at some point. Um, which brings us to the last section of the show where I always ask people the same Vasm, but not questions. So for you, um, when you instantiate streaming on any of your streaming devices, what is it that you currently watch or are listening to? Yeah. That's a fun question. Let's see. Like in mornings, I'll, I have a, have a podcast series I've been going through. It's called Revolutions by Mike Duncan. It talks about all these great historical revolutions over the last 300 years. It's like 500. Oh, so you episodes. like history too. <laughs> so fun. Only as I get older, but it's so interesting. It makes a lot of things make sense in retrospect. So that's how I get excited in the morning. And then during the day, I stream stuff on Spotify, lots of, lots of death metal and black metal bands and atmospheric black metal and post black metal. Can, can you do work to listen by, by listening to death metal? Especially good for working because you can't understand <laughs> the words. So it just gives you a feeling of like, yeah. And then you do your work and it doesn't enter the two parts of your brain. Exactly. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, it's like people like often people do classical music for that. It's just like, you know, my, my variant of classical music. And then in evenings, uh, the kid, my kids, we have, Three kids and they're getting the age where we can watch fun stuff with them. So we go through some of my favorite series like uh, Arrested Development or 30 Rock or Rick and Morty for some of the older ones and uh, and Kirby Enthusiasm and I Think You Should Leave and just finished watching, what was it, Beef, which is really good. That's with my wife, mm -hmm. not kids. <laughs> but uh, yeah, those are those are good series. Amazing. Yeah. So I love working to death metal. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> I will too? try that. Oh, wow. We should, like, we should like the concept. Yes. I've never, I, I've never tried. I've never tried. I just came okay. back from a, from a festival in, in Germany. And, um, I listened to a lot of death metal there. <laughs> it was kind of fun. That's great. <laughs> but I never tried working to it. I should try that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And, um, the last question about, uh, WebAssembly, but not is, so if there's one thing that you could local get as in something that you do and then global set as in something that you wish, everyone or at least a lot of people um else did what would it be so what would your local get and then global set on everyone else or you can if you want reverse the question what would you global get and then local set those are, those are, it's a hard question i in the restricted mode where it's just a good chunk of people when able <laughs> one of my learnings during covid was that a, a short jog in the morning does wonders for the rest of my day uh in terms of physical and mental health. So that's that's a habit I've tried to keep up. And uh, but of course, everyone's able to do that for a variety of reasons. But, uh, but if you can, I think it's a, it's a nice nice habit. I do agree. So my runs are in the evening after work where I just reprocess and calm down. Um, so yeah, running is definitely something that more people should be doing. Um, yeah, thanks. Cool. Um, wow, this was a long episode. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Luke. Um, yeah. If people want to want to follow you, um, if people want to learn more about you, um, what social networks can people find you on? Or do you, I don't know, just maintain your GitHub and that's it? Mostly GitHub, but uh, I, I barely, barely have the smallest uh, Twitter presence called Luke Wagner, yeah. underscore Wagner. But uh, mostly I just retweet cool stuff that's happening. Like you have a blog? Is this a company blog or you have a private blog as well? Not really anymore. I used to blog a little bit at Mozilla at some of the things you link to, but uh, yeah, not as much. Mostly just still on GitHub and presentations. Cool then. Um, thank you so much again. Um, it was great having you on the show. And um, yeah, with that, I see you all and listen to you all next time. Goodbye. Thank you, Luke. <laughs>